We were making our way into the heart of the Pacific coast of Mexico, the joyful coast. Algal blooms can be toxic, or they can simply just suck up all the oxygen in the water. Although the algae brought dead zones without much marine life, we always found something to eat. We came here just to have this dish. Fish and shrimp wrapped in bacon, smothered in tangy almond sauce. Very interesting. We met up with friends in Barra de Navidad, and enjoyed a special treat. Mm, now it was time to fly from the tranquil lagoon. Okay, we're loose. The boys from the catamaran tribe ushered us out of Barra while testing out their new outboard. They had also lost their old one. We noticed this wreck of a cargo ship on Google Maps months before our voyage here, and finally had the chance to see it up close. Some local pangas were running day trips to the shipwreck. At Isla Peña Blanca, we were closing in on Manzanillo. The autopilot started acting up. Robbie and I cannot agree sometimes on whether or not the music we listen to is wholly inappropriate or totally perfect for the situation. What do you think? At Carazal Cove, we found whales, but no suitable anchorage, with the swell sweeping directly down the avenue. We continued on with an hour or so of light left, to the nearby Las Hadas, which would hopefully be more protected from the southwesterly swell. We observed a fair share of cargo ships, lingering around the entrance to Manzanillo's industrial sector. Burrowed into the small corner of Las Hadas, the view was of a hillside enveloped by white hotels and villas. With so much ongoing development, the fancy waterfront didn't have very many options for landing a dinghy. The large beach was too far away and without an outboard, pretty much impossible to land. The marina wanted 10 times more pesos per day than previous places we've paid to tie up our dinghy, and the marina reportedly didn't have very good facilities for the price. So we landed in front of the restaurant next to the marina, bought a soft drink, and climbed up to the road from there to catch a bus to the supermercado and back. <laughs> The red algae followed us right into the small cove, but it didn't ruin the fun of our sailboat neighbors and their kids. For now, like other places we'd visited so far along the coast, the villas seemed quiet and empty, while us boats enjoyed the decently dry, pre-hurricane season weather out on the water.
Leaving Manzanillo, we were weaving in and out of cargo ships, carefully, some of them stationary and some of them making their way north. Looks like a bear elite. This was a less than ideal fish in a less than ideal location, being right outside of the industrial sector with smokestacks in the background, but we had our food for the day. It just seemed like we kept on seeing peculiar things on this passage. Look at this, it's a turtle with a bird on top, sitting just bobbing up and down. That is so sweet. Long lines are very long, usually nylon lines, with tethers attached to it, every so often with hooks and buoys. And they're pretty long, and in this area they're pretty shallow. We got caught in two already. Ah, we got it. This area around Manzanillo seems to have seems to be the start of uh, long lines. Yeah, we were approaching some Coke bottles floating in the water, and once you you see those, you know you're uh, you're in for some fun because there's a coke bottle on either side of you it means you're going over a line that's that's floating just beneath the surface they're very shallow our keel ran into one of these lines it wasn't sliding down off the keel uh, which is kind of lucky because it didn't slide between the rudder and the keel and then get into the prop but uh, we hit the reverse and got out of there, got out of the first one pretty much untangled. Then we ran into another one and it seemed to be that there's a red coke bottle, uh, another red coke bottle and then a green buoy or a green bottle and I think that meant like go through between at night. You can't, no matter who's on watch, you're not going to see that stuff coming so wondering if it's, wondering if it's worth it to get those extra miles in. And then it was Robbie's turn to settle into what I call the hot seat for a three hour or so steering session. At Cabeza Negra, we would have to make the decision about whether this would be an overnight passage or whether we would stop for the night. The direction of the swell told us that the anchorage would probably be too uncomfortable. So we kept on trucking. You, think? you look like a bandit. <laughs> I'm stop getting sunburned. The next day we were welcomed again into a harbor by the sight of smokestacks and some jolly cetaceans. Sneaky dolphins. Without an autopilot, we were feeling exhausted from hand steering for more than 30 hours, and we were not looking forward to hand steering for another full day. We decided to ask permission from the harbor master to enter Puerto Lazaro Cardenas. <laughs> Okay, okay, so I follow the, the tanker that's going inside the uh, next. Yes. Okay, okay, and I can anchor in the fishing basin, that's right? No, patrol boat, patrol boat. Uh, you drop anchor in a uh, fishing basin. Okie dokie, uh, I will follow the white tanker coming in. Uh, thank you very much for control. Uh, talk, uh, standing by on 16 if you want to talk to me. Thank you.
we followed the other vessel inside while making sure to keep clear of the large cargo ship coming out. It smells bad. I think it's poo. Somebody's bilge. The port authorities came to meet us on the way in, and they escorted us to the anchoring spot. They looked at all our paperwork for the boat. Despite the smoggy, dirty appearance of the water, large grazing sea turtles were bobbing and diving all around. After some tinkering with the autopilot again, it seemed unquestionably kaput. We had nothing else to do than raise the mainsail and install ourselves at the tiller again for a toasty, cloudless passage. Robbie reflected on our stay in Lazaro. One guy asked permission to the other guy, the other guy asked permission to the other guy, and after going back and forth about five or six times, I could hear them. On the radio? On the radio, they were like, well, yeah, we could kind of let them in, they're probably tired, so they let us in. Then they came and they asked us all kinds of paperwork, and we apparently gone to sleep, and they showed up again, and they wanted more paperwork. <laughs> they, they said, oh yeah, we're, we're going to send uh, some, the Navy wants to come and like check your boat. So yeah, okay, like whatever, like send them whenever they're ready and I could hear them like discussing on the radio, discussing us on the radio and what kind of boat we are and we are and they basically classified us vagabonds, vagabundos. Rosa's official uh, designation is is uh, vagabond, tramp. Well, what did you say? She's rough. She's rough, yeah. Official de designation is rough travelers. When we saw the pangas and the crowds, we knew we were in the popular local tourist destination of Ixtapa, or Isla Grande. We spotted friends on SV Adventure and on SV Dogfish. At this island getaway, pangas, jet skis, and fishing boats moved in and out all around the boats. We 
We didn't collect a proper supply of drinking water in Las Hadas. We didn't have one peso left in our wallet. And so I found myself pumping the manual desalinator that was lent to us by a friend. This emergency water maker was surprisingly working well. The key is to use the preservative biocide treatment when storing it for some time. Or, because we didn't come by any of that stuff, to keep on pumping it weekly. I could pump about two liters an hour. That thing only pops out when I keep pressure. Good morning, how are you guys? Good, how about you? Good, good. Uh, we're just um, stuffing our face with some crepes. Well, actually, Brenda wants to know if Justine wants to go for a little walk over on the beach. I was going to take her over there. Uh, so, yeah, just checking to see if Justine wants to go for a walk. Over. Yeah! She says, okie okay, okay, that sounds great. Our lovely neighbors invited me to the mainland shore, which was pretty tricky for us to get to without an outboard engine. Brenda and Jeff from Adventure. Hi. Thanks for bringing me to shore for this excursion. <laughs> First time on shore in like a week. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so docile, I was laying there. Look at those ones, they're cuddling. Having been anchored at the island for some days before us, they had already staked out the area and found the crocodiles. Oh, you know the name. I looked it up, yeah. I only even know like that. Weird neck. Brenda and I walked along the busy beach of Ixtapa, filled with locals enjoying the sun, looking for just the right spot to pick up some coconuts. Going cocoa for coconuts. I don't want to scare you, but I think that this is probably the most dangerous task that we've been doing in our lives recently. One of the most statistically uh, possible ways of, of dying in the world or something. One of the top or comparable top uh, causes of death is coconuts falling on your, on your head. And here we are. Um, then I looked up, where did that come from? And it's, there's no proof by it. There's no proof. Uh, it's just fake news. Yeah. <laughs> While people occasionally get injured or even killed in rare instances by falling coconuts, there are no definite numbers worldwide to suggest that more people are killed annually by coconuts than, say, by sharks. So there's no need to panic, everyone. I'm getting quite greedy. I've got all the coconuts now. All of them. More than I can carry. Later on, after the ladies of Adventure and Dogfish had done all the hard work processing some of the coconuts, we were invited over to Adventure to enjoy the fruits of that labor. Fresh piña coladas. Mixing just the right amount of coconut cream, pineapple, rum, and ice made for a boatload of happy people. Oh <laughs> Stop. We need to get a blender on the boat and ice and a fridge and all and everything. We need to get everything. Mm -hmm. 